Welcome everyone to today's session on the intersectionality of immigration and family law. My name is Narupa Netram. I co-chair the immigration law practice section along with attorney Indira Demine. Please keep in mind today's session is being recorded and is pending CLE approval. Please feel free to chat your questions with our panelists who are going to answer those questions at the end. Before I turn it over to our amazing th three speakers today, who are Eloise Ayala, Colin Abbott, and Carla Campos Anderson, let's go around the virtual table. Tell us what you do and the best thing that happened in 2021. Indira, I'm gonna ask you to kick us off and then we'll go to our speakers and our attendees. Awesome. Hi, everybody. My name is Indira Demine. I'm an immigration attorney um, in Fort Myers. I, I do practice exclusively immigration law. Um, and Narupa and I co-chair this immigration practice section. Um, one good, so I just got back from Disney World and it was my first time going to Disney World with my family and it was an awesome experience. So I'm really, that's a highlight of 2021 for me because I grew up in a different country. So Disney World, huge trip. So there you go. All right, go ahead, Carla. Hey everyone, my name is Carla Campos Anderson. I practice here in, mostly in Lee County, Florida. Sometimes I venture out of the out of the 20th Judicial Circuit. I primarily handle family law cases. I started my career as a public defender, then I was a private criminal defense attorney. So I still take on some criminal defense cases just because I like to go in the courtroom and be in front of a jury. Um, the best thing that happened this year is that we got to travel again and got to visit family. So I've already visited my family in Maine, went up to the Panhandle, and I'll be going to California in a week to visit my family in California. Great. Eloise? Hello, everybody. I am Eloise Ayala. Um, I practice exclusively immigration law also at Collier County with Legal Aid Service of Collier County. I am the supervising attorney for the immigration unit there. Um, we do pretty much anything in a family terms, in terms of immigration, including removal defense, um, with jurisdiction at the Miami courthouse. Um, I'd say the best thing of 2021 so far has been I travel also. We were able to do go to Cancun twice this year. Um, I grew up there, so to me that's home. So that was a great part of this year so far. Um, hi, my name is Colin Abbott. I am currently the uh, interim executive director at Florida Rural Legal Services. I'm also the acting advocacy director, and uh, you know my background is immigration law. I'm originally Canadian. So I came to the U.S. 22, 23 years ago, and I, I'm a barrister in Canada before becoming an American uh, JD at Stetson. So, uh, you know, my whole life has been doing immigration law. And now I sort of, we're, we are an LSC funded program. We're limited in what we can do. So Eloise, uh, so, you know, can talk about the uh, non-restricted type work. And uh, I can sort of go into the humanitarian family law component of immigration and the areas like that. And I guess the, the best thing that happened to me in the, the last year is the fact that my wife and kids are healthy and happy. And, you know, you know we've lost some family members that, through COVID, but, you know, it, it, you know my immediate family, you know, we're, we're doing okay. And my two kids are back in school. So that makes my wife and me a little happier. <laughs> so outside of that, so it's just good to be here and thank you. Thank you all for sharing. I'm now going to ask our attendees to please feel free to come off mute if you'd like to introduce yourself and also share the best thing that happened to you. I'll go first. Hi, I'm Christina Holly. I'm a family law attorney exclusively here in Fort Myers, um, doing divorce custody mostly. Um, and I'm happy to be here. I will have to leave a little bit early because I have a one o'clock hearing on Zoom with Judge Carlin. Um, so when I leave, don't 
that's not me being rude. It's me leaving to go work. Um, but probably the best thing that happened to me in 2021 is that, uh, well, I'm banking on it because it's not over, the year's not over yet, but I'm banking on the fact that um, I am taking my two young children to go see snow for the first time um, on December 17th at Park City, Utah, which has always been on my bucket list. And we finally got sick of worrying about COVID and we booked it and we're going. So thank you. I'm going to um, just be off video because I'm eating my lunch while we're doing this. So <laughs> thank you. I'll go next. Uh, I'm John Lonergan. Uh, I'm an attorney here in uh, Fort Myers and I do family law. Uh, quite a bit of probate and estate planning. Um, I'm getting of the age where uh, we're kind of phasing out of our family law. Uh, the best thing that happened to me, to be honest with you, is Zoom. And I love Zoom and I love doing the hearings by Zoom. And I got tired of going to court because it's so inefficient. And I hope that we never go back to in person, but I'm hoping to phase out soon. So except for uncontested. So hopefully I'll never have to go back to court. I love court, but I don't like being in court. So it also allows me to travel. I think Carla knows I, we travel quite a bit and uh, we have a place up in the mountains. And actually for a year, we lived at our place in the mountains and I worked from there uh, remo remotely by Zoom. So I hope the judges never leave Zoom. Thank you. My name is Julia Finman. Uh, I work with Shelly Finman, my dad. I've been here for about six years. I worked in Tampa for about seven. Uh, Christina, I'm 37 and I have never seen snow, so I need to get out more. Um, but uh, I think the best thing that happened to me is my grandparents, they live in Indiana and they're 91 and 92 and my grandmother got COVID and that was, she was on world news and that was the first time that they've been apart in 70 years. So then when they were reunited, they were on um, the world news entertainment tonight and everything. So um, she's doing better and they are back together again. So. Hi there, my name is Katie Napolitan. I work in family law and criminal defense, mostly in Charlotte County. And the best thing that happened to me this year was that I got married. And we did actually COVID in a way helped it because we did just the two of us and a witness. It was no frills and very inexpensive. Um, so it worked out great. All right, anyone else? Some really great shares there. I see Lauren has also chat that the best thing that happened to her is being a part of this amazing voluntary bar. And we are equally as grateful to have you leading us, Lauren. So thank you all again for being here on a Friday, especially. I'm now gonna turn it over to Eloise and Colin for an overview. And then uh, Carla will jump in and we'll do a deeper dive on this topic. Well, at least you can go first. All right, hello everybody. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna talk a little bit, just general information on, um, on the family side of immigration. Oh no, if it works, because you know, Mac can be a little, Um, and let me know if you see my screen. Oh, no. Not yet, Eloise. It's not going to let me. And no worries if you can't share the screen, you can just educate yes. us. I'm going to do that because otherwise it makes me have to quit and reopen. So I'm not going to do that. So I'll just talk about it generally. <laughs> Um, so like I said, I am the professional attorney at Legal Aid Service of Collier County. Um, we are not just an LSC organization, so I am not so restricted in funding in terms of uh, what we can do. So we do, as long as you know it's viable, um, we do things like TPS and DACA and um, renewals and uh, family petitions, consular process, mm, citizenship, 
um, a wide range. And on top of that, removal proceedings, uh, which probably takes most of our practice removal proceedings. Um, but today I'm here to talk about family law and how immigration comes in, and how they um, come together. So first is, you know, who can I petition for? So how, who can a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident petition for? So U.S. citizens can petition for their spouses, parents, children, and siblings. Um, hold on, let me divide. It's weird. Not looking at myself, making sure that you guys are there. Um, so U.S. citizens, again, spouses, parents, children, and siblings. However, in terms of children, there's different categories. There's those children who are under the age of 21. There's those children, or rather not children anymore, over 21 and unmarried. And then there's those who, who are already married and over 21. And why that matters is because depending on what category that fits in, depends on how long you have to wait for a visa to be available. So in terms of what we call immediate family members, and those are the ones who don't have to wait for a visa, those would be your spouse, your parents, and your children who are under 21 years old, and that's it. For example, if you petition for your sibling, that's over a 15-year wait. <laughs> if you petition for your, your one of your daughters or sons who are over 21, you're looking at six years or so, depending on country also. Well, what about residents? If you're a U.S. resident, you can petition for your spouse and your children. That's it. So no parents and no siblings are in there. In terms of children, again, it matters what type. You have those who are unmarried and under 21 or those who are unmarried and over 21. So that's a key difference. For U.S. citizens, you can petition your sons or daughters even if they have been married. Um, but for residents, you can't. And again, for residents, um, there is no wait time in terms of visa availability for your spouse and your children under 21. But for those who are over 21, there's years of wait in between. Um, so it's, a, it's a, often a question that we come across in our office. We have people calling all the time and saying, well, I want a petition for my parent. And are you a U.S. citizen? No. Well, then you have to become a U.S. citizen first before you can petition for your parent. Um, another um, often asked question is stepchildren or stepdaughters, stepsons. Um, can you petition for them? Yes, you can. So the general rule is as long as you marry that child's parent prior to their 18th birthday, you can petition for them as if they were your biological um, child. That is, there's no adoption needed in that process. But again, that's prior to the 18th birthday of that child. After 18 years old, well, then that's a whole different story. <laughs> um, but it is possible. And then, for example, if I petition for my spouse, who let's say is in Colombia, and that spouse has two children of her own from a previous relationship, when I petition for her, those two children would be, if they're under 21, will be included in that petition, and all three of them will be allowed to enter the United States at the same time. How much does a petition cost? The petition alone is $535. That's what immigration charges anyone who wants to file a petition. This does not include the resident card process or the consular process, um, just the petition alone. Let me backtrack a little and speak about the consular process versus not having the consular process. So when, I ref when I'm referring to consular process is with when your family member is outside of the United States. If I'm petitioning for them and they live outside the United States, they have to go through the process that we call consular process. That means they'll have to go to the nearest embassy and um, process their applications, interview, all that stuff through there, have their passport stamped with a visa to allow them to come inside. When you don't have the consular process, it's when the person already lives in the United States. Assuming for you know, purposes of this talk that they've come in with a visa, um, they lawfully came in, um, usually when you petition for that person, as long as they're an immediate relative member, which is why I mentioned it earlier, they'll be able to um, adjust their process inside without having to leave. Um, there are some exceptions and I'm not gonna go into <laughs> that much detail, but um, this is the general of the way things work. Um, now, diving into marriage-based adjustment, 
That's one of the terms we often use in immigration law, marriage-based adjustment. So what we mean is I've, I'm a US citizen or resident and have married um, a foreign spouse um, and now I want them to become a resident. Um, and that's what we mean by marriage-based adjustment, meaning they're adjusting the status to that of a resident. So when you marry that person, you must prove with immigration, with USCIS, must that you entered that marriage in good faith, meaning that you're, you know, I think that's obvious, meaning that you enter for real, not for immigration purposes. Um, in some cases, you may have to file later to remove conditions on your resident card. And that happens when you've been married for less than two years. Um, and you were approved prior to the second year anniversary. Um, after that, you have to file what we call a Form 751, I-751 to remove those conditions, allowing you to be a permanent per se uh, resident card. Sometimes this is very confusing because the resident card looks exactly the same. The only difference is the expiration. Um, and so pe some people don't um, know that they have those conditions. Um, so usually you can tell if the expiration is two years from, a, from I'll say resident since an expiration, I'll have a two year timeline. And a permanent resident that doesn't have the conditions usually would have a 10 year um, validity of the card. Um, so that's, that's a way that you can tell, for example, you may have clients that don't know that. Um, and again, if you find yourself with a client that does have these conditions and it won't say, you know, there's a conditions on it, it'll just, you know, have that little time difference. Um, they'll need to be able to file again and show that they entered that faith, that marriage in good faith to have those conditions removed. And often that comes with other issues. Well, you know, it's time for me to remove these conditions, but I've divorced, what now? Um, well, <laughs> there are options. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of clients, do not know that. They think that if I leave the marriage now, I won't be able to, you know, to stay here. And that's even more often, more frequent happens when, when um, they're in abusive relationships. Um, thankfully, there are options. Um, as long as that marriage was entered in good faith at the time to enter that, that marriage, it's okay if you have separated from that partner after it does mean you still have to prove, you still have to prove again that you've been in that marriage for as long as you could and it was for real, it was a real man marriage and again, not for immigration purposes. Um, and there's other um, exceptions like um, if you were a victim of abuse during that relationship or if you file late because of abuse and among other options. Um, let's see what's next. Um, and that's where I'm going to dive into leading into Colin. What if you have been a victim of abuse mm -hmm. and you leave your spouse? Yes, your client can leave your spouse even if they've been a victim of abuse. Often you will hear, well, I can't leave him because he says that he's going to deport me. No, um, there are options. One of them is VAWA and another thing is the exemption under the 7512. And I'm just going to let Colin um, start from there. Sure. Okay, thank you. And so uh, as a background, a, a little, little bit on these types of cases, what, uh, what you find is that Eloise has given you the standard procedure for family members to seek immigration help. Within that whole scope of uh, the life of an immigration case, and even before a uh, filing has actually been done, there are now special what are known as humanitarian family law immigration events that can help a client secure benefits without actually meeting all the thresholds that Eloise uh, you know, really well presented to you. And it sort of there's, it's almost like a, uh, disclaimers or you know, options that are there. And it, they're getting to that component is awfully one of the worst and hardest parts of being a humanitarian immigration lawyer. I sort of wanted to begin the whole talk with that, is that uh, uh, trauma is probably the biggest uh, concern that we have as immigration lawyers that concentrate on humanitarian immigration because our clients are, are victims. You know, there's, there's a set requirements that they have to provide to immigration showing the victimization. And oftentimes, as Eloise said, that where children can get benefits, 
There's also ways that the children can get benefits as derivatives through the humanitarian immigration. So let me go right into the different, I'm going to break it down into four different areas. One of them is the, the playoff uh, from what Eloise said about the 751, and that's the, the condition to remove a green card. And like Eloise said, you know, they're for people that have been married less than two years at the interview. But say, for example, what happened if someone was into an abusive relationship and the, the person had to leave the home and go to a shelter. And we've had cases where that's happened three weeks, three months, you know, 18 months into a relationship. There is what is known as a domestic violence waiver as well available. It's similar to the divorce waiver in the sense that you can bring it in. And with that type of waiver, you don't need the, uh, the sponsoring US citizen spouse to sign the 751. And as Eloise said, the 751 is the core document to show that get the conditions removed. And usually it has both the spouse and the beneficiary sign. With the waiver, you don't need that. And you know, what we will do, say for example, at, uh, at Frills where we do these types of cases, we'll represent the client in the immigration hearing. You know, you'll see me or one of my colleagues at the field office we're usually there for these types of hearings. And they, what I call it is 751 plus, in the sense you have the more evidentiary burden, you have to prove the domestic violence. A lot of the officers, field officers are trained in the domestic violence training. And in those cases, it's easier. Some of them aren't, and you know, most of them do receive training over time. And not only does the 751 the DV waiver help in the sense the person can get the same green card you get as if you're married to the American, it also enables the person to become a citizen within three years rather than waiting for the five. Because the, there's a special clause in the, uh, the N-400 naturalization regulations that say if you get the 751 based on a waiver, of domestic violence, you actually can then file for this for the uh, N four hundred for the citizenship with the three year threshold from being married. And I don't know if a lot of you are, are doing seven fifty ones now. Very few seven fifty ones are actually approved within the first year of uh, filing. I've got cases where it took two years to get them. And now I'm getting letters that are extending it past the 18 months, two years of continuation. So in several cases, I've actually gotten the 751 interview for domestic violence and turned around the next day and actually filed the N-400. Because you, you gain back all the time. So when you gain, the 751 takes so many years, you're going to gain back all the the permanent residency from the date the original two years started. And that's a trick that I, I, we use a lot. You know, I, I had one go through this week in, in Fort Myers where I approved, got her a 751 only approved uh, about five, six months ago. And they went and they, they gave her an N-400 uh, on Monday. So, you know, that's something that's big because for us as victims advocates, it makes the client whole, in a sense, immigration whole, I mean, right? It doesn't help them trauma-wise, but it gives them a foundation. You know, they don't have the worry now, oh, is my spouse going to deport me? Like Eloise said, that's a common event. So that's sort of, that's the core one that we do. And we're very proud of that one. And that's something I wanted to, like, to begin my, my you know, 10 minutes with, because that's something that's unique. And a lot of private immigration attorneys and a lot of humanitarian immigration attorneys don't really know that that's a pure example that can be used to help people right away. Another way that we help people, and Eloise is correct in the sense also that children and children getting sponsorship and the fact that you help, you know, you follow the I-130 and you get the family members in through I-130s with them and get the counselor processing. If, for example, a person is a victim of, the, of a serious crime and files for a U visa, I'm not going to go to the U visa and the, and the life of a U visa waiting because 
you know, we'll all be retired when the USB will be approved that are in now. <laughs> so if you put them in today, you know, your children will probably be adjudicating them by the time they're done. But, you know, there are good things happening with use with due process and prima facie and everything. But the big thing with the U is that you can also get derivative use. And there's mechanisms whereby you can file and a U is a non-immigrant visa that's especially available to victims of specific crimes and domestic violence is one of those crimes. And with that proof, under the new guidelines, they'll get a prima facie determination, which will be valid for four years. They'll also get an EAD work permit that's gonna be valid for four years. That's if the, at the threshold level, they meet it. They may not actually get approval, but they still may have a pending U. So not all U's that are filed get the threshold review as the uh, ombudsman meeting explained to us. And uh, maybe when they get into it, they'll stop doing it that way. Because a little hint was when they did the ombudsman meeting, they actually said, we're not going to give you any slides. <laughs> so, so in other words, you know, this may not be the last rules that they come out on with these. Also with the U visa derivatives is that you can get the family members and there's specific rules about who qualifies as family members and who can bring in the U and everything else. And, you know, like uh, was said a few minutes ago, there's specific rules as well as who qualifies for U derivatives. And, you know, if a, a child is a certain age, they can bring in their parents and then they can, if they're another age, they can bring in their spouse, you know, they're married. There's also rules that are related to children that are indirect, that are actually victims, but the parents may be the ones gaining the U. And that's an indirect U visa. And we do a lot of those in, the, in Lee County as well. And in those cases, you know, the child may actually be, uh, be, you know, an American. We did one where the child was American, but the, the mother, you know, uh, was an indirect victim in that situation. Also, very similar to the U derivatives. And I'm not going to go into all that because that could take, you know, that's a 10 minute speech just on the U derivatives. There's also what is known as a T visa. And a T visa is a victim of human trafficking. Severe human trafficking is the definition and it has many components. But like the U visa, the T visa enables family members, derivatives to also gain status. The big thing also with getting a T and a U non-immigrant visa, it is a direct mechanism to then get a green card. So it uh, goes in a similar fashion to Eloise's way of doing it through the I-130, like to the sponsorship, but it doesn't have, you know, the affidavits of support and everything else. So we often will do U adjustments. And with U adjustments, Come the fact that you know people go from non-immigrant visa to green card and we also help family members go from green card to citizenship a couple of unique components about the t and the u which is should be noted is that with the uh, with the u visa you can actually have the person leave the country and they can do the u uh, a processing the counselor processing the t visa that doesn't happen because you, with the T, you have to be still present because of the severe trafficking. But under the U, there's actually a provision that allows you to get a U as a trafficking victim. So what I, I tell people is if they're, they've left and they were trafficked, we can still try to get a U for them. And again, you know, that whole component there, it can be a mess. And I love to speak. So I'm going to turn it over with one more little tidbit. And the third one is the whole I-360. Eloise mentioned that, uh, you know, as an option. The I-360 is a self-petition that enables people with domestic violence. And the, but the, the thing is, is that the abuser has to be a permanent resident or a citizen. And the spouse has to be the applicant to the I-360. And there's a lot of definitions there. And I know we're going to Q&A uh, questions and answers, Q&A about the, you know, spousal and marriage certificates and stuff like that. But there is a requirement that they be married. There's also specific requirements that you can file the I-360 post-marriage. 
uh, at divorce, you know, I'm not going to go into the weeds on that one as well. But, you know, if anyone has questions or, or thoughts or, you know, wants someone, I'm always available to like sort of act as a mentor with you and T's and VAWAs. And I've done these for a long time. So again, you know, I'll have, uh, you know, uh, uh, my email put up there after and we can, uh, you can share any questions with me directly. So thank you and I turn it back. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, now I know a lot of you on this call are primarily family law practitioners. And I know all of this immigration language can get a little complicated, right? Because there's a lot of immigration terms that we're talking about and so on. So I don't want it to go over your head and you're like, what are they, you know? So I, I wanna give a very elemental explanation of something. So one of the ways someone, someone who's undocumented or a foreign national can gain legal status in the United States is, is one of the main ways is what Eloise talked about, which is a family petition. So I'm a US citizen, I want to petition for my spouse, parent or child, right? So a US citizen can file that petition for that immediate relative, um, siblings are also included and so on. What Colin, what Eloise talked about at the end is um, some, some people will be granted conditional residency based on their marriage to a U.S. citizen because by the time they're ready to do that interview for the green card, so I'm a foreign national, I'm married to my U.S. citizen, we have a marriage interview. By the time that marriage interview and they're ready to issue the green card, if you've been married for less than two years, then you get a conditional green card. And a conditional green card basically means we're going to allow you to become a lawful permanent resident, but only for two years because you've been married for less than two years to the U.S. citizen. Now, 90 days, so you got to look at that green card and there's going to be an expiration date on that green card. And 90 days before that green card is set to expire, you're supposed to file a form called a 751 form to immigration and say, look, my husband and I are still together. It's still a valid marriage. But what ends up happening a lot of time is that the marriage falls apart, right? And that's what Colin was going into is if the marriage falls apart because there's domestic violence, well, there's a waiver. The immigration doesn't require you to stay married to someone who's abusive, right? So there's a waiver for that joint filing um, because the idea is in two years, you and your spouse should file this form again, showing you're still together. If you're not together, you have to explain why. So a lot of times I get clients that come see me and say, all right, I'm thinking about, about getting divorced. How is this going to affect the 751 that I have to file in six months? And, and, and the bottom line is, if the marriage was valid and lawful and viable at the time you entered into the marriage and it fell apart for a valid reason, then that's fine for immigration. Even if at the time you're ready to remove that conditions, you're no longer married, you're divorced at that point, it's okay if you're able to document it. For example, um, I filed 751 saying, okay, valid marriage, U.S. citizen spouse, cheated on, on, on the foreign national. Well, that's fine. We don't expect you to stay with someone who's cheating on you. If there is any evidence of, we grew apart, there's financial issues. He got arrested or she got arrested for a so-and-so. So I no longer want to stay with them. Whatever reason, um, or they no longer love me. That's a valid reason, right? So as long as you can document that the marriage fell apart for a valid reason, but we really loved each other at the time we filed this and it was a, a viable marriage, then the 751 will still be approved even though the marriage fell apart. Now that 751 removal of conditions, remember they get a two-year green card, they file a 751, they have to wait for that 10-year green card. That 751 right now is taking two years to adjudicate. So your client will get a letter saying your green card is extended for 24 months to allow them to remove that conditions on the residency card. Now there are additional ways family members can gain lawful status simply by being related to someone else. And that's what Colin was going into. So you can petition for someone as a US citizen petitioning for foreign national, but what Colin was getting into the U visa and T visa. So if I'm a victim of a crime, I'm a foreign national, 
I'm a victim of um, robbery. I was held at gunpoint in robbery. My child is foreign national, 10 years old. That child can be a derivative on my U visa. I would file a U visa as a victim of a crime. So if I'm completely unlawful and I'm a victim of a crime, I can file a U visa and I can include my spouse and my children who are under the age of 21 as derivatives under my U visa. The same that Colin was talking about, the T visa as a victim of trafficking, um, human trafficking um, or labor trafficking. Now he's the expert in, in T and U visas, but those, those are ways a family member can gain lawful status simply by because of their relationship to someone who qualifies for the T visa or the U visa. So I just wanted to give that brief overview because I know all of you, most of you are family law practitioners. So I didn't want any of this to, to go over your head. So um, Narupa, take it away. All right. Thank you all three of you for the insightful information. I'm now going to turn it over to Carla. And keep in mind, we're going to wrap up around 12.50 for your questions. You can ask them live or keep them coming in the chat. All right, thank you guys. By the way, I really appreciate being here. Um, the last 24 hours, I got this bug from my daughter who brings all these sicknesses to the house. Um, so I'm glad, John, you just mentioned Zoom. I'm glad we're doing this through Zoom so we could do this. This is my opportunity to ask all of these questions that my clients come and ask me that I have no idea because they're immigration questions, but they're related to family law. So what, um, uh, Nirupa and, and Dira did is that they've uh, compiled a list of questions that are very common when clients come and have a consultation with family law attorneys. And I saw also in the chat section, the attorneys that are present, they themselves are, are asking questions. So I'm going to go back and forth and, um, and try to hit on the points um, that I think are really relevant and probably come, come to us a lot. So Indira, you asked, I believe you answered John's question, um, if the marriage is not a sham marriage um, and they are in the middle of, a, of, of the immigration process, they can still file for divorce. There's not gonna be any type of repercussions. Um, then, um, But what I think I'm reading John's question here, but what if it, the, US, the US citizen spouse alleges that the marriage was a sham? Actually, this has happened. This happens a lot. What happens if the US citizen spouse alleges the marriage was a sham just to obtain citizenship? What happens at that point? Does that affect the immigration process? Hi, so I, I can handle that a little bit because that happens a lot with the domestic violence type cases. You know, it, it's discretionary by USCIS and, and uh, even ICE to conduct an investigation if they choose to do so. We've had cases whereby the abuser or the alleged abuser have actually gone and given statements to, uh, to immigration, alleging that exact uh, definition. And what will normally happen is, is that the threshold for interview will go a lot higher. You know, we expect to get a lot of requests for evidence, an RFE, and that an RFE is the uh, is a standard way to know that the immigration doesn't like what you got there so far, unless it's an RFE of something you already put in, and we're not even going to go there. <laughs> so that happens too. So in the but uh, I've seen cases if if it happens before the 485 has been adjudicated. That's when the person gets the green card originally. Normally what will happen is, is that the, the interview will completely stall out. And there's a possibility that they'll do a hearing whereby the individuals will go into separate rooms. And you know, they'll, they'll, they can do uh, you know, a really uh, sort of a New York type hearing where they, they almost ask you, you know, what toothbrush they use and everything else. And you know, that kind of a, of a situation. If, if it's after the green card, there is an opportunity that uh, they, they can open up, uh, technically they could open it up again. And, you know, uh, and if they determine that there is fraud there, you know, 
there, there are special provisions on the, the uh, Family Immigration Law Acts of the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, whereby you know, they can be charged as felons. And, you know, and that's sort of the whole basis of why the two-year two green card's out there now is based on that. And, you know, I, I, Eloise, uh, anything, you know, I'm sort of rambling now. Yeah, um, I answered in the chat also, like, just like you said, um, they often, you know, keep going with their investigation and they just kind of like look at it with more of a finer eye, um, focus more, raises the standard of proving that you entered the marriage in good faith, um, questions everything, will interview you or might not even interview you depending on the allegations that of the of the other person, which straight up denied. Um, they can do any of those options. Um, and I'd say most of the times they'll likely deny it, um, the application, unless you really got some good evidence. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, what if a client is going through an immigration process? It could either be they're um, filing for residency or adjusting it from a residency, residency to a citizenship, but their, their other significant other, it could be um, their spouse, has filed an order of protection against them. How does the filing of an order of protection, if it's granted against that person, how does that affect their pending immigration case? Colin? Sure. So yeah, I did want to, I, so, but uh, what we usually do in those types of cases is that uh, there's certain requirements to get the green card is the family based, including like uh, living still together. More than likely, you know, they're separated. What we would do immediately, we would go and file an I-360, a self-petition, because if it's a family-based immigration based upon being married to a U.S. spouse and there is a uh, order there in place. Now, I'm assuming that the abuser is the American citizen and the, you know, the, the victim is the immigrant. Now, I've seen cases where it's the other way around, where the abuser is the, uh, the uh, non-citizen. And in those cases, if the abuser, I'm gonna go that route a little bit, if the abuser is a non-citizen, there's a possibility that uh, they will freeze all the immigration processing and they could issue what's known as a notice to appear. And then they could face uh, immigration court. And Louis, Eloise is the expert on that because we don't do those. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's what Carla was, um, I think talking about if the immigrant is a user, um, likely they'll stop the adjudication. If, if it's been, been before the approval, they'll stop and um, they'll likely say, well, then no. And then they'll NTA you, notice to appear you into immigration court because now you're removable. Um, and that leads to a whole new mess. Um, if it's after the resident card appro being approved, I think, I mean, in both equations, it falls down to the petitioner to report this to USCIS also, if that's what they want. Um, oftentimes, USCIS might not even find out there's this order out there, especially after the resident car has been approved. Um, now, the petitioner, you know, actually goes to USCIS and say, hey, now this person's an abuser. Um, even after approval, they'll take it away too, if they, they want to. Um, and again, NTA, you to the immigration judge, so. Um, and, I just. And we've seen cases whereby it'll only come up, uh, like Eloise correct, when say someone 10 years later goes and files an N-400 and the N-400 is a, is a FBI fingerprint check and they'll come up and say, you committed domestic violence eight years ago. You know, not only are we not going to uh, allow you to become a citizen, we're going to send you an NTA now. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so um, um, Carla, what you were talking about, um, like like both speakers said, if it, it there's two places, um, two things that can happen. If the person is completely undocumented and they're relying on the U.S. citizen to give them status, and they've abused that U.S. citizen, chance and there's a order of protection, chances are that the U.S. citizen isn't going to move forward with the petition. You just abused me. I've taken this protection order out and and immigration does have the option of saying okay foreign national 
um, we're going to put you in deportation proceedings because you've, um, you're completely undocumented and you've committed a crime. Now, if it's only a civil order of protection and it's not a criminal charge, right? Um, so there isn't a domestic violence charge. That's a big difference because if they're in immigration, if I'm a green card holder, so I'm a lawful permanent resident and I got a order of protection taken out against me, that's a civil order of protection. So technically there's no criminal conviction on my record. So I, they could not place me in deportation proceedings simply because someone took out an order of protection against me, my green card holder. If I violated that order of protection as a green card holder, that's a ground of deportability. So I can get my green card taken away if I violate that order of protection. And I see that happen quite often. Um, so it's very, very important when if someone has an order of protection taken out against them, they need to comply with it if they're a green card holder, because that there's a ground of deportability for violation of orders of protection. Thank you. That's good to know. Can, can is that going to be held against a, the married couple if they filed a prenuptial agreement? Let's say that the United States citizen has a lot of property, has businesses, and he wants to protect that. It's a valid marriage. They want to enter into a valid marriage, but um, he wants he or she wants to marry the foreign citizen, um, but wants a prenuptial agreement. Is that going to somehow adversely affect their marriage petition? Um, I think that's a main question for the private bar. <laughs> that would be the Andrea, but um, cause my clients wouldn't have for nuptial agreements. But um, I don't see why that would cause any issues. Um, actually, it would probably even to me would be more of a evidence of that's a real marriage. Right. Um, no, unless the prenuptial agreement is like you know I'm protecting myself because we're doing it for immigration purposes. Other <laughs> than that, I don't see why it would create an issue. So. Yeah, I I don't even um, like you said, Eloise. I would use it to show look, this is a valid marriage to the point yeah. where, uh, you know, they, they're wanting to protect their assets because um, they see this, you know, this, I use it as, as proof of valid marriage, but it does not, it doesn't affect the validity of the marriage. Right. And how does an annulment, if, if we don't have a statute in our Florida statutes, but we can do it through common law still, file an annulment for marriage, how is that going to affect a pending marriage uh, petition? If the annulment is regarding that marriage itself, um, it'll, it'll act the same as kind of divorce. It'll just become, un there's just no marriage if, if the annulment goes through. So it'll all fall down. There'll be no, no adjudication. Bye, you know, so. <laughs> and and it, yeah, and, and it's it can actually be worse if, mm -hmm. let's say you got a green card through US citizen spouse, right? My US citizen spouse petitioned for me. And then that marriage became annulled. Mm -hmm. Then that green card is not valid any longer because yeah. you got the green card based on this marriage. If a divorce happened, well, that's fine because marriages fall apart all the time. But annulment yeah. tells immigration the marriage wasn't even valid in the yeah. first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that green card is automatically um, no longer valid if the marriage is found to not be to be annulled. So an annulment is is very is is very very has grave consequences if the person already has the green card based on that marriage. And, and, and it's all based on the fact that the American immigration law has a specific definition of marriage. And you know, we, American immigration doesn't understand that common law can exist. You know, in in some countries like I'm Canadian. And when I did Canadian immigration law, you could do it for common law relationships, but here you can't. And also, you know, that's the whole issue with DOMA. You know, the, the fact that there was no recognition of same-sex marriages, even though it was approved, it wasn't accepted by the federal government. So annulment is like that in the sense that, you know, it has a fit the exact definition of immigration as the marriage is defined as. And you, were, you told me that we only had to 1150. It's 1151. Do you want me to keep asking questions or do you want to open it up to the, um, the remainder of our, of our guests here? Let's see if anyone has any questions live. Um, go ahead and get off mute and ask the question. 
If we don't have any, Carla, I will tell you to truck on. Okay. And I don't see anyone coming off mute. So let's continue with our questions. Okay. Another thing that comes up a lot in front of me is that we have uh, a foreign national spouse um, committed fraud in their previous marriage. And now with their new spouse, they've been married for you know years, let's say 10 years. They have um, two children. They're in a lawful valid marriage. Can the new spouse sponsor the, um, can the new spouse sponsor the children of that person of the current marriage? So um, the first thing I would do before I even would advise any of that is, well, you know, get those records first. Why? Because if there's an actual finding of fraud, that person can never petition anyone else, no matter who they marry, it could be, you know, president. No. Um, but that's why it's so important to get those records, because a lot of times the applications get denied without the actual finding of fraud just saying, you know, we're denying it because there's just not enough evidence. So, you know, there's a fine line there. But if there's actually been a finding of fraud, fraudulent marriage, then no, there's no, you can't petition for any other, of, the, of any other spouse. And what would we be asking? What records would we be asking for? Um, their immigration records. Uh, the denial letter will say that. Um, facts like where they interviewed together, um, you know, but likely the denial letter, the letters from immigration will, will include that language. And, okay. and Carla, what the, there's a process called FOIA. And FOIA is a process whereby the uh, individual who is the, uh, the person you're trying to help can sign documents. And uh, there's now you can upload them directly into a portal. USCIS has a FOIA portal. And as attorneys, we have access to that. And they'll drop uh, all the uh, documents like uh, Eloise mentioned. And you can ask for the whole file or you can ask for specific elements of a client's file. It's very difficult to get third party files. I've gotten some where it involves like dead persons and relationships, you know, their relations, but it's very difficult. Years ago, we had to wait for months and months to get CDs, FOIAs. Now I'm finding they're pretty quick because you can get them like in there. They create a portal that you can win your own portal and get the documents. Right. Um, you, you, it's first.uscis.gov, I believe it's the website. Um, mm -hmm. And the forms are G639. You want to include a, a G28 also that your representative and asking for on their behalf. That's pretty much, in, you know, I think, I don't know, you can, you can FOIA any agency for that matter. Um, like FBI and everybody else. So it's, for, it's pretty much asking USCIS to give you any records on that person. Um, you said it's FOIA, that's first, what's it called? First? Mm. First. Freedom, Freedom of Information Act, yeah. That's and, the website. And, and there's actually now a specific one. USCIS has their own FOIA uh, division now as well. That's uh, different from the other one. And as it, they have it into their USCIS homepage. There's a that's portal that's, yeah. Yeah, first.uscis.gov. That's yeah, their that's portal. It. Yeah. And you mentioned, Adira, earlier that there's a two year um, from the time that, that the non US citizen gains their residency, they have to wait for two years. Why, why two years? because they've been married so so if if you're gaining your residency your green card through marriage so a u.s citizen petition for you at the time they're ready to give you that green card okay we've approved this marriage you're ready to give you the green card at that time if you and the u.s citizen have been married for less than two years then the law says you have to be granted a conditional green card. So we're only gonna give you a green card for two years because you've been married for less than two years. So that's what the conditional green card is. But at the time of the marriage interview, so we're ready to give you the green card, you've been married for two and a half years, three years, then you'll get the 10 year regular green card. Yeah, and it's really just to um, give you time and make you file another application showing that you're still in it for the good reasons. So that's really the purpose behind that. 
because the idea is if you've been married for a short term, there might be a higher probability that this is a fraudulent marriage. Oh, you met in June, you got married in July, you filed in August, and now we're here next August. There's a higher probability of fraud if everything moves quickly and you get you apply for the residency pretty quickly. So it, it's a way of kind of safeguarding because we're gonna check again on that marriage in two years to make sure, oh, are they really still together? What evidence have they acquired over the last two years that they've been married with the green card, basically? Um, so in that two years later, they want you to file a form that says, look, we're still together. Here's proof we're still together. We filed taxes together, we built a house, we got a kid, whatever. And then when can they then convert that to a citizenship? So three years. Um, you can apply for citizenship after being married to a citizen for three years and been a green card holder for three years. So you have two years on that conditional green card, and then you file to remove your conditions on your green card. And then while your conditions, removal of your conditions is pending, you've now acquired three years on your residency card. You can technically file for citizenship after three years. So two years on the temporary card, one year while your removal of condition is pending, at that point you can file for citizenship. Now I know that there is a, a, a portion of this is there is some type of interview that is done with the spouses either together or apart. Mr. Abbott, you mentioned something that maybe they'll ask you about the toothbrush, like what kind of toothbrush? Yeah. What kind of questions are asked um, in, in these interviews? So it, it depends on the officer and the, uh, like I mentioned, the, a lot of the times they'll do requests for evidence. And with that, they'll gain a, a set of packets of different items. They may ask you specifically what's in that evidence, the detail, but what they normally will do is they'll ask for the daily life of both individuals and they'll do it separated. They may ask, oh, what's your spouse's favorite restaurant? I've had cases like that. And the spouse will come in and say, you know, it's, you know, McDonald's or, you know, you know, uh, we're, you know, on most Friday nights, what do you do? It's sort of this, uh, you know, is the test to see if they're really together. Now, I've even seen cases whereby they've asked, what color is the curtains on your, uh, you know, in your kitchen? Or, you know, what? And uh, usually the questions deal more with uh, third party relationships. They'll often ask, you know, uh, have you met their parents or have you met their brothers or something? Because there's always under the uh, theory is that people that are committing marriage fraud for immigration purposes tend not to associate the, the fraud with their family. I find a lot of cases they'll, they'll ask for that. And in some cases, if that's something we think about, we'll actually get affidavits from family members and, and put it in as part of the packet saying that. And, you know, but, you know, technically and by law, they can pretty well go anywhere with these questions. You know, there, you know, there's crazy, uh, you know, videos on YouTube and everything else that talk about, you know, asking about the, the sexual preferences of the, of the relationship and every, you know, there, there it's, it's possibilities that can happen, but, you know, normally and, you know, discretion is valor with that and they will go in. A lot of clients get really scared though because they see the worst case scenarios from YouTube. And we see that a lot where they come in so panicked that they're gonna have one of these weird interviews. You know, we have to get them off the cliff to do their prep. Well, maybe prepare for the worst and hope for the best, right? Exactly. <laughs> They'll be repaired. I right. do wanna say that separating you know, interviews with being separated is not the norm. That's usually when they're you know questioning something uh, for the most part, at least in my experience, they don't separate them. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, exactly. Is there any of any of our guests, do you guys have any questions? No questions. And I see we are at time. I want to thank all of you. This has been so insightful. I learned a lot today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to all our attendees. Um, stay tuned for our programming next year and have a great weekend, everyone, and happy holidays.
Thank you. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. I'll see my friends at I'll see my friends at the field office in Fort Myers.